Psalms 86 Lord, bend down to listen to my prayer. I am in deep trouble. I am broken and humbled, and I desperately need your help. Guard my life, for I am your faithful friend, your loyal servant for life. I turn to you in faith, my God, my hero. Come and rescue me. Lord God, hear my constant cry for help. Show me your favor and bring me to your fountain of grace. Restore joy to your loving servant once again, for all I am is yours, O God. Lord, you are so good to me, so kind in every way, and ready to forgive, for your grace fountain keeps overflowing, drenching all your lovers who pray to you. Psalms 86, verses 6 and 7. Hear, O Lord, my prayer, and listen attentively to the voice of my supplications, specific requests. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, and you will answer me. Psalms 86, 8 through 10. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name, for you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. And Psalms 86, 16 and 17. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the son of your female servant. Show me a sign of your goodness. My enemies will see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped and comforted me. The question that I want to ask as you start your day, as you go through your day, is Jesus a part of your day? Does he just get a piece of your day? Is that on your day planner, whether it's written or whether it's in your mind? Is there a scheduled time that, okay, I have prayer, I do study, and then you put that aside and then that's it for the day? That's a routine that, okay, God got his amount of time and now we move on. And these are questions that I, I ask you to think about. How do you start your day? Is Jesus a part of that first five minutes? Does he get five minutes throughout the day multiple times? The question is, how important is Jesus to you? The amount of time you spend with Jesus or sharing your life with Jesus may tell you something. It's not just a part. He is not just a part of your day. He's with you all day, every day. Whether we're, we're thinking of him or not. But we can share our life with him in so many ways. You know, as we go through our day, you think about your life and the question comes that I would I toyed with this but it would be kind of fun to do if I were to talk to your neighbor or a co-worker or a family member what would they tell me about you what words would they share about who you are would they all say the same thing would there be some Differences, but there would be maybe a few things that would be a constant across the, the spectrum that they would all recognize and say something. But how would they describe you? What would they tell me? Would they comment that you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus? The song that was played by Lisa, uh, By Our Love, was originally written by King and Country, and the piano piece was played, we had the words, and the, the phrase, the, the repeat is, they will know you by your love. By your love. 
you have your Bibles, we're going to go into Matthew 10. We're going to begin in verse 24 and go through verse 39. Today I will be using the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Kind of use different translations from time to time. I think it adds a freshness uh, and a perspective. And in verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. It is enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a slave like his, man, uh, his master. In essence, that student is not bigger than his teacher. The slave is not bigger than the master. And if we can accept and be willing to share the fate of the master, that's what he's asking. Are you willing to do that? If they called the head of the house Satan, how much more the members of his household? So if you are in that world that lives a certain way, are you willing to accept the consequences, good or bad? Verse 26, therefore, don't be afraid of them, since there is nothing that there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. Those secrets that are out there or things that maybe somebody has said negative to you, they will come out. God will open that door. Those secrets that you maybe are holding, they will come out into the air. The, somehow, some way, God will open those doors so you don't have to worry about secrets or if you've been the victim of secrets uh, or comments that were negative against you they will err and God will show the right and the wrong of what people are doing a reference that you can look up on your own is Mark 4:22 and Luke 8 and verse 17. Mark 4, 22, and Luke 8, 17. Now pick this back up in Matthew 10, verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. Maybe in the night you were awakened with some thoughts or maybe as you were reading in your morning uh, devotional there was something that just hit you square and you go yeah I get that are you willing to share with others are you willing to express the joy in knowing that Jesus is working in your life verse 28 don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to cure to kill the soul rather fear him or God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell are you more worried about this life your everyday life than the future the eternal time with God which is more important this temporary life or our life in the future forever. And again, a reference point that you can look up is Hebrews 10, verse 31. That's another point that ties in here. Verse 29, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them falls to the ground without God's consent? You know, God knows everything about you. There are no surprises that you can't go through and say, oh, surprise, and God goes, oh, I didn't see that coming. That's not the case. He knows every aspect about you, and if he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, you think he doesn't know what's going on in your life? Are you more important than a sparrow? I believe so. How do we know what the value or the importance of that? Again, John 3, 16, God gave his son for us. 
Not for a sparrow, but for us. Verse 30, even the hairs of your head have all been counted. You know, and the old joke is, uh, as you age, that's easier for God to keep track of. That's not the point. God knows you through and through. He created you. He's been with you since there wasn't a you. And he still is. Verse 31, so don't be afraid, therefore you are worth more than sparrows. Verse 32, therefore everyone who will acknowledge me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Do you let people know who you are? Do you let people know who you are in Jesus? And I'm not talking about standing on your sidewalk out in front of your house and shouting or, or berating people as they come by. But by your life and the choices you make and the words you say, do you represent who Jesus is in you? These are things that would someone say, yes, they they are a Christian. They do represent Christ. I see that in their life every day. And a, another reference to tie this together is Romans 10 and verse 1. In verse 33 back in Matthew 10. But whoever denies me before men, or whoever refuses to admit or acknowledge me before men. If you are afraid to acknowledge Jesus in front of other people, and I'm not talking about being overt and in your face type, but you quietly live that life. If people ask you questions, you are happy to share who Jesus is in your life. Many times people have said, or had come, someone come up and go, I don't know what it is about you, but you have something that I want. There's an open door. Do we, how do we handle that? What do we say? Back in verse 33, the second part of that, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. If you deny Jesus, to other people, somewhat like Peter denied knowing who Jesus was. If you try and skirt or deflect the question, essentially he's saying here, if you deny me, I will deny you. Jesus and the God, triune loving God, wants that relationship with you. Do you want one with him. Don't assume, and this is verse 34, don't assume that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. When Jesus comes back, it will be in, among the midst of conflict and division. People won't be happy to see him. And one of the things that shook me, I, and I still wrestle with this one, this week, I was watching a, a reading a news blurb on the, uh, my internet, on the computer, and there was a picture from one of the protests and the riots that were going on. And front and center of this picture with a poster that said, if Jesus comes back, kill him again. That, I, I mean, I just stopped me cold. I've never run into that kind of an attitude or response. Kill him again. I hope that that has an impact on you as well. 
he was absolutely denying Christ. What is my response to that poster? What would I say to that man? Certainly, he doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't know the love that Jesus had for him as he put the sign together, as he stood in front of the crowd with that sign. He doesn't know that God loves him, apparently. And I'm not judging. I'm not. But I, I was shook to my very core when I read that sign. Back in verse 35, Jesus continues, For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Essentially what he is saying, do you love your family more or me? If you have to choose between, is God always first? Is Jesus first? verse 37 the person who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me the person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and i love my wife i love my family i love my children my grandchildren but this is telling me i need to love jesus more jesus is the center and I have a quote here from the Life, Life Application Study Bible, the NIV. And it is based on this verse. Jesus calls to a higher mission, calls us to a higher mission than to find comfort and tranquility in this life. Love of family is a law of God. We know that. But even this love can be self-serving and used as an excuse not to serve God or do his work. Who's first in your life? Chapter 10, verse 38 of Matthew. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Essentially, you can't sit on the sidelines. God wants you active and loving. And you go, well, what can I do? I'm a retired person that's single at my house, and I don't get out a lot. My family all lives quite a distance from me, so what can I do? Ask God. Maybe in that morning when you wake up, ask God what plans he's made for you that day. What actions do you need to say or do? You don't know what your day's going to entail. You may have a day planner that's got it all worked out. And at the end of the day, a lot of that day planner never happened. Are you willing to hear what God is telling you? Are you willing to be a part of what he is doing and not remaining on the sidelines? Again, from the life application study uh, section on this verse, to take our cross and follow Jesus means to be willing to publicly identify with him, to experience almost certain opposition and to be committed to face even suffering and death for his sake. You know, this isn't the most warm, fuzzy things to, to think about. That, okay, I acknowledge Jesus that you are in my life. I love you, and I'm willing to share that. But it's going to cost me a friend, a family member. It's going to cost me uh, problems in my job. Where does that, where do you find yourself in that? Verse 39, anyone finding his life will lose it. 
and anyone losing his life because of me will find it. Again, a, a section from the life application study on this particular verse. Clinging to this life may cause us to forfeit the best from Jesus in this world and in the next. The more we love this life's rewards, the more we will discover how empty they really are. We need to loosen our greedy grasp on earthly reward so that we can be free to follow Jesus. This life is temporary. You live three score and 10 on average, somewhere uh, beyond that, others have never made that point but it is temporary. Every one of us, our DNA says we will die. Is this life what you live for? Is this life's rewards what you cherish and, and desire? Or is there a bigger picture? Is there the rewards of eternal life that are out there It's so easy to get caught up in a day-to-day -day world. It's so easy to allow the pluses of today, the rewards. You know, I, I love spending time with my family. I absolutely love. But is that the end? Is that all there is? No, there's an awesome future for all of us. In John 12 and verse 25, the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. When you wake up in the morning, when you go through your morning regimen of, of activity, is Jesus a part of that? Are you asking for him to direct his plans Is your eye on the prize of the future eternal life with Jesus or on this life as we live it with aching bones, aching muscles, blisters on our hand for at least one of you? The, the life that we live is temporary and it's short. Regardless if you live to be a hundred, that is still a short time in God's time. That is the future eternal life is forever. And that is hard to wrap our minds around. I realize that, but it, it will just get better and better and better. We must be so committed to living for Christ that we hate our lives by comparison. This does not mean that we long to die or we are careless or destructive with the life God has given us because this life is a blessing. God blesses us every day with this life. We have food to eat. We have water to drink. We have air to breathe. Uh, we all have clothing on. There are so many blessings that we have in this life. But by comparison, how does it even, how does it even equate? This does not mean that we long to die or that we are careless or destructive with the life God has given, but that we are willing to die if doing so will glorify Christ. Releasing control of our lives to Jesus who brings eternal life and genuine joy. And again, that was uh, a note out of the application study Bible. Do you live every day asking God to let you glorify him to helping you glorify him is your life based on and doing things for a future life existing in this one appreciating this one but it's not the it's not the prize the prize is in front of us 
It's out there. It's coming. There's this, that was a, a diagram that I copied, but then I realized you guys can't see it. So I'm going to read a piece of it uh, to you. It says, counting the cost of following Christ. Jesus helped prepare his disciples for the rejection many of them would experience by being Christian. Being God's person will usually create reactions from others who are resisting him. If I were able to talk to the young man with a poster on that diagram, he would be definitely resistant to anything I would say because he is resisting anything Jesus is saying. We have our vision and mission in our church, and I want to ask you if this applies to you outside of the Sunday that you're in a church. Is this something that you take with you in your home? in your job, in your travels. Our vision from Grace Communion Derby, God's love for all experienced and shared. Is that something you have written in your heart for your life? And the mission of Grace Communion Derby to provide welcoming environments to learn and live the gospel. When you have family together, I'm not asking you if you preach to them, if you set them down and you have to read scriptures or you discuss, but are you providing a welcoming environment? Are you a person of peace? Do you share the gospel? Maybe not in those words, but the gospel is the good news do you do that? And again, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm asking you to evaluate how your life on a day-to-day -to -day basis goes. Who is first in your life? Do you start the day with Jesus? Do you end the day with Jesus? Do you ask Jesus to assist you in everything that you do maybe you are hosting a group of children or you're taking care of the neighborhood's children for the afternoon do you provide that welcoming environment do you share and live the good news that God has given to you Remember that Jesus is always with you through the Holy Spirit. We don't have to question that. That's a given. That's a promise that we have. Do you look forward to the prize, to that eternal life with Jesus? Or is that just something that's out there? You, don't, it, you know it's coming, but it's so far just out there. Thankfully, it is. That's a gift and a promise that God gives us. Being able to share him with others, Jesus says he will share us with his Father. We are something that he has given his life for, and he wants us to share. We're glad you joined us this Father's Day. If you have questions or a prayer request, you can reach us at our website at gcderby.org. We can also be reached through our Facebook page at Grace Communion Derby. We would like to hear from you. May you have a very blessed week. We thank you, Jesus, for each person, and we ask for your strength. And God, let us Look to you daily. In Jesus' name, amen.